Welcome to Child's Play, the podcast where we explore inclusive early years education, empowering practitioners to meet the diverse needs of every child. Today we'll be celebrating gender diversity with Lee Lester. Lee Lester is a youth rights advocate manager at Mermaids, who works to amplify the voices of young people throughout the organisation and beyond and facilitate youth events and spaces to understand their needs. Mermaids is a charity that supports transgender, non-binary and gender diverse children and young people, as well as their families and professionals involved in their care. Today we'll be chatting about challenges faced by trans youth, as well as success stories and how educators can create safe and inclusive spaces within an early year setting. Let's dive in. Morning Lee, how are you? Uh, I'm doing very well, thank you. Yeah, it's a bit rainy here in Sheffield, but other than that... The exact same in Manchester. No, it's very rainy. Grim up north. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we were hoping that you would introduce yourself and tell us more about the work that you do and how you're changing young people's lives. Yeah, no problem. So, um, yeah, my name's Lee Lester. My pronouns are he, him, and I am the Youth Advocacy Manager at Mermaids. Uh, so Mermaids is a national charity. Um, we've been going a fair while now, since 1996, and it started out, uh, the charity, just as some parents coming together who had children who were expressing... Um, gender diversity in whatever stage they were at um the parents looked out in the world for some advice and guidance and realized there was very little so they said well if if we can't find that advice we need to be the ones that give it so they they pretty much got around the kitchen table and said how can we help each other and from that mermaids grew to be um yeah a national charity and, and what we do is is exactly what it says on the tin we we support trans, non-binary and gender diverse children and young people, their families, and we also extend that offer to professionals who are involved in their education and care as well. So we do lots and lots of different services. We have a helpline where young people can call us directly or parents and, and carers can call us directly to get advice. We have web chat services. Um, we have an online forum when people can get advice. And then we do a whole different you know side of our organization as well which is about change making campaigning new advocacy actually trying to make the world a better place for trans people to thrive not just working on you know their well-being but actually what does the political landscape look like can we campaign and lobby to try and make changes as well so we have you know lots of different initiatives but the most important part is it's about just getting trans youth to, to thrive and to feel validated and that's kind of uh, what we've been doing for the last few years, and my role specifically as youth advocacy, is to get young people's voices heard, to amplify the voice of trans youth and sort of say, look, you know, tell us, tell us how you feel, tell us what you're angry about, tell us what you want to change, tell, tell us the success stories, and, and let's try and platform, you know, those voices as best we can. So I'm very lucky and very privileged to have that job and to be able to speak to trans youth and their families on a daily basis and, and help them feel, like you say, valid in who they are. It's an amazing job that you do. We were wondering, what are some of the common challenges that are faced by young people? If you have any particular stories of impactful experiences um, of maybe youth who've overcome the challenges, because obviously the political landscape right now is a bit tenuous, um, to say the least. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so, you know, again, in my role, uh, I'm so fortunate I get to actually speak to trans youth directly. So that we, yeah, we run a lot of focus groups that, that look at what are the things that are affecting trans people disproportionately. What are the real reasons that they that, that they struggle? What are the, the genuine barriers? Not not the barriers that, that the media portray or that people think. What are genuinely the things that children and young people who are gender diverse are struggling with? And one of the main things that comes up is healthcare. You know, that's a, a really difficult area. Um, accessing opportunity blockers is becoming more and more difficult and, and under new NHS guidance it's looking like you know that that's going to become even more um, difficult um, there's the three year waiting lists for, for young people now to even be seen by a gender service which you know is a very long time to, to be sat on the waiting list with no ongoing support so a lot of young people you know are really struggling with, with that process um, so healthcare is a definitely a big area that comes up a lot but actually I suppose what's most relevant to so what we're talking about today is education is probably the biggest um, cause of distress and confusion in children and young people who are gender diverse. Mm -hmm. in education, um, there are some amazing examples, amazing examples of, of, of staff um, and, and schools going above and beyond and, and doing really right by their, their pupils in general, not just the gender diverse ones. 
But there are also some examples where that isn't happening and where things are very outdated, where unfortunately schools aren't necessarily trying to do harm, but they are so frightened of potential consequences that they they are sort of opting out of supporting in the way that I feel or our group organisation feel they could. So the things that kind of young people are reporting from an education perspective are that, that trans young people are now disproportionately excluded from PE and sporting activities, that they their parents um, are being informed on all the things that they are saying to their teachers just about the the exploring of their gender identity that's being raised as safeguarding issues or flagged as problematic or what that needs to be like um investigated almost as opposed to just letting that child um explore and experiment um and then things just even around using their chosen name in the classroom using the pronouns that feel the most appropriate to them being able to just go to the toilet in a, in a space that feels appropriate and safe you know all those things are the, are the main things that young people come to me and say this is what is causing me the most distress in my day-to-day -day life you know the political landscapes are quite scary but actually the day-to-day -day simple acts like just going to the toilet or having your name used is, is the things that young people are saying that we we need to tackle before anything else before the bigger you know wider structural situation we need to look at the on the ground stuff um and there's some yes yeah, great examples of how how mermaids and other organizations have helped our helpline is is fantastic and such a, a wonderful resource and we've got some brilliant examples of young people calling our helpline having issues in in school or in, in their community and getting really good honest fair advice um and we've had lots of great quotes come back uh recently we have feedback from a pair of you contacted us seven years ago and it's always lovely when parents or carers or guardians get back in touch and say that, you know, we rang your helpline seven years ago and we were in a terrible place. And now our son, our trans son, has just gone to Cambridge University and is absolutely thriving. Um, all because that initial conversation you told us it was okay and to just let him be and, and develop and just give him kindness and space to thrive. And now, you know, he's going on to do amazing things. Um and, you know, after after Cambridge Uni, that's not always the, the, the aim of our charity, isn't it? We, we don't have a set agenda of what we think trans young people is a, is a success. Sometimes it's just them being alive and being well. Um, and we have loads and loads of examples of parents and carers ringing us back and saying, you know, our child's doing really well now. Um, and that's because of the advice that, that's been given. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great job and I love it, but it's, it's often a very difficult job as a trans person myself as well to kind of, you know, to feel the, the, the distress, the confusion and the frustration that comes from the trans community um, with all the aforementioned issues that are kind of out there. Yeah, I think it's so important, everything you said. And as a trans parent yourself, have you had the experience, especially with scores as well? What's that been like? Yeah, so I guess it's fascinating that I can see it from sort of both sides of the, the situation, you know, both being... Um, somebody who works with trans youth and, and helps schools, but also I do have, yes, two, two children myself who are uh, four and very nearly sick in a week where the time has gone very quickly. <laughs> um, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm an out trans parent. Um, I, I've never hidden that from my children. There's absolutely no point doing that. I don't believe in, in kind of being, um, holding that back from them. Um, so I've been very honest about that with them. And I mean, my children have been brilliant. They're, they're phenomenal because children have an incredible ability to take things at, at face value. And if you just explain things to them in a, a appropriate, child appropriate way, then they, they understand and they are probably quite interested in something else in five minutes time. Um, it's really not that sensational, but you know, the school have been brilliant. You know, we, we mentioned it at the start, um, cause I was kind of going through the transition process. And at that point I was relatively early on in my transition. So I sort of mentioned it to the school and they said, okay, what, what can we do? Um, which is a great question, isn't it? You know, just a nice open, what, what can we do? And, you know, we simply said, it's just as simple as just making sure that you're aware. And if anything was to arise, you know, throughout school, you'd come to us and, and speak to us about the best ways to move forward. Um, so school have been really supportive. Most people who do know in the school or have conversations with are barely batted an eyelid. They're probably more curious than anything else and curiosity is far better than prejudice. You know, I'd rather someone be curious than, than outright um, hostile or unsupportive. So I've had a great experience. I know everybody doesn't have that same same example uh, to give, 
but I do think schools are really trying and I, I want to sort of, you know, give a shout out to the kind of education community because I think there are some phenomenal schools out there who are doing so right by their pupils. Um, and I just hope that with new government, uh, you know, legislation suggestions that may be coming out, that I really hope schools really stick to their guns and, and do right by their students. Um, because I think there's so many brilliant examples and there's so much evidence to prove that children, young people that are supported in schools around their gender identity go on to thrive in adulthood and are being more or less likely to be bullied, less likely to be excluded. There's so many compelling, there's so much compelling evidence of why um, self-expansion is important for all children and gender diverse children are no different. Mm. So as you said, um, it's really important that uh, educators specifically for this podcast, but just anyone can um, be supportive to trans youth and trans people in general. Can you share some insights on how practitioners can become effective allies to young people and also their families and friends? Absolutely. This is the area that I think I get the most passionate about. So, so please bear with me if I go off on a, a, bit, a bit of a rally and a tangent about this because I, I'm so, so passionate about trying to explain as simply as I can, that the things that we put in, in place for gender diverse children in, in schools or early year settings benefit everyone. They are not special. They're not special considerations. They're not going actually particularly above and beyond, but it's putting in place some of the basics that suit everybody and help all children to understand the world around. So prime example of this is, is what does our early years or our school settings look like what do the posters on the wall what do the, the the play areas look like do we have posters of lots of different types of people doing lots of different types of jobs do we have lots of people from different diverse backgrounds skin colors um, disabilities that can all be encompassing jet the diversity as well um, and then you know example in early years is obviously you have your play areas your dress up areas is there just a range of different dressing up options that that can be worn by anybody you know are the, the people that you know the adults in the room understanding and supportive of children just putting on whatever they want to dress up as and not saying well that's that's a girl's outfit well that's a boy's outfit you know and and the big one for me the really big one is, is the language we use um in schools it's really simple to to not use gendered language if you practice it and you as a school, embed it in your kind of, um, your school ethos. I go to so many schools, an example of this, I went to a school recently, completely not actually to do with sort of a gender diverse thing. It was actually doing some sports coaching and they, they light the children up and they said, boys on this side and girls on this side. And I said to them, oh, just out of interest, um, why, why do you line them up, boy, girl, boy, girl? And they said, oh, well, one teacher said, it's a behavioral thing. I sort of said, oh, what? That seems a bit, okay, right, fair enough. And then another teacher said, well, it's partially that, but also, I mean, they need to know if they're girls or boys, don't they? And I said, why? And obviously, they weren't expecting it. I got a lot of very blank expressions, but I could see the cogs turning. And as I left, I said, you know, sorry if I threw you a, a curveball there. I confused you, but, you know, this is what my, my job is outside of this coaching. And we had a really frank and open conversation about gendered language and how actually what damaging that is for all children. Um, do your children need to know if they're a boy or a girl? I think they know anyway. And actually, do we need to reinforce that by telling them that they are? Or actually, could we use lots of other language available to us? There are plenty of um, options instead of boys and girls, ladies and gents. There are plenty like, you know, team, learners, folk. They're, they're tongues. We can be creative with that language. So I think, for me, what schools could do is not reinvent the wheel. I'm not asking for you know, to, to, to go above and beyond necessarily. I don't think any of these things are, are huge, but just look at the environment, look at the way you speak to young people and, and is it inclusive? And if it is, then young young people, gender diverse children will thrive in those situations. But then it gets more complicated also as you move up to secondary school because, you know, the things are a lot more gendered in, in other ways and, um, you know, PE, toilet facilities, things like that can, can be problematic, but open and frank conversations is the start and you know move leads are here to help and advise on that you know we have a great deal of professionals who can support and help if schools are struggling over an issue around a toilet facility give us a call talk to us have that open conversation instead of kind of saying well 
we can't do it. We'll just, you know, we'll, we'll just carry on as we are. You know, let's have more open conversations around ways to simply make schools more inclusive. I think that's so right. Just on a complete tangent, it just reminded me of this um, James A. Caster sketch. I don't know if you watch James A. Caster where he goes on about, um, I can't remember exactly what the premise is, but he's annoyed that people use she or he and it's just so much simpler just to say they and this is just like a common thing that i see in um like government guidelines or just any sort of um paper at all where they say she or he why do you just say they it's so much simpler and shorter concise we're very appropriate if anybody gets down into semantics and all they is plural or this is that we can't use they to describe one person or stuff oh people just need to need to evolve really it's not worried about the grammatics of things because actually surely making people feel comfy and valid void and safe is more important mm-hmm. than, that, than for whether they is a singular or a plural mm-hmm. really that's what we're getting down to to me that's just a slightly uh slightly daft way of of, of arguing something you know like you say language is out there to be developed and used as appropriate that there really are no set of rules and what's more important to me is that the children and young people feel safe and loved and cared for in schools not really the language we use um so i agree i think if you had i thought he she they fascinated yeah just use that it's, it's fine you use it all the time if we don't know someone's gender we say we say that yeah why we then when somebody specifically asks to be spread to be used do we go oh no we can't do that it, it, it just seemed seem a bit daft and, and like you know, I, I understand. I understand pressures that the teachers are under for many, many reasons in schools at the moment. It's a difficult job. I, I live with a former teacher and, you know, I witnessed firsthand her journey through working in school and some of the things and the pressures that were coming up. And this can feel like another additional thing to have to think about. But I keep coming back to my initial point of you should be making schools inclusive environment for everyone. This isn't just about gender diversity. I'm not sat on this this podcast now going all schools should think about gender diversity put it at the top of the priority list and make schools the perfect place for gender diverse pupils above all else that isn't ever a suggestion but by doing the simple small wins what we are doing is just making classrooms better for everyone and then in turn gender diverse pupils will will feel better these are all just the basic human rights that all children should be afforded in schools. None of this is revolutionary. I, I really don't think so. And I just, I just hope teachers take the time out to educate themselves. There's some brilliant resources out there. And what was really reassuring is uh, my wife, who's a, a, a consultant around education, went into a school um, that were doing training for for pupils who want to uh, go into health and social care and work in early years. And what was so lovely is on their agenda was how do we make um, how do we look at gender and gender roles in an early year setting and how do we ensure that, that children feel that they can express themselves safely and it was brilliant to hear you know pupils coming up with ways in which they could do that and all of them were simple little wins again um, it was all just around making the space feel inclusive showing different types of people having really honest conversations with students so there's some brilliant work being done which is really reassuring um, and I think by building discussions around gender diversity into lesson plans and books. Books is such a huge one, you know, we have in our house. We have a, a library of books around diversity that my children can just go and pick and read. And I've seen firsthand the benefit of that. We have an amazing book called Bodies Are Cool. If you haven't heard of it, buy this book instantly. This is my ultimate recommendation. And it's all just about different kinds of bodies. And that's every different type of body you can imagine. And what was brilliant about when we bought this book was my four-year-old at the time had a little look at the book and she saw a picture of a, a trans man with top surgery scars and straight away went oh my daddy's got those scars and instantly there was you know an open discussion and some um real relatability it, it was a love it was lovely for us as a family to have my body represented you know in a book so that's bodies are cool by uh tyler Feather. so put that on your your book list anyone listening um i highly recommend it it's brilliant and i think something else is that children ask these questions and then they're off again. You know, it's not something that they have a massive issue with or, you know, it's it's having that, as you said, inclusive and safe space and having those conversations with children and not being afraid of it. Yeah, I think 
it's just about meeting the children where they are. And I think you don't even have to lead those conversations. You don't have to be the ones who drive a particular, say, agenda very loosely. I hate that word. It's been very misused when people talk about trans agenda, which you know, doesn't exist. Um, you know, teachers or, or caregivers don't have to drive those conversations. The children will come to you when they want to know something. So if you make the environment safe and inclusive and there, there are visual stimuluses and books available, a child will bring you a book and say, oh, this book's about this and, and I'm wild to maybe talk about it a little bit more. And then you can just have a really simple conversation of like, oh, yes, there's you know, a great book. Tango makes three. It's about two two male penguins that have an egg together. They they, they sort of foster an egg together. Um, it, it, and it's, it's a cracking, cracking book for, for younger younger kids. And that instantly um, evokes a conversation about, oh, these two boy penguins and that they're, 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 they love each other. How does that make you feel? You know, do you think that could, do you think, you know, two boys could love each other? Do you think that's, you know, what do you think about that? Questions. You don't need to actually even impart any anything other than it's okay. But you can ask lots of questions like, what do you think about that and stuff? And, and what that does as well is we've got to remember that, yes, there's gender diverse children. Yes, there might be children who are experimenting with their sexuality or other things. They've also got parents who potentially are transgender or, um, or gay or a multitude of other different presentations. So what we're doing by allowing those children to ask questions, they might be asking those questions because that book is mirroring what they're seeing at home. They might have a Tango Makes Three situation in which you know, their parents are, are both male or both female or, or one is trans or whatever it might be. So by having those conversations, we're also supporting their family dynamic as well as maybe their expression as well. So we've got to remember that, that the world, thankfully, is changing and evolving. Um, and, and our classrooms and our conversations should just mirror that. But I would always just say, don't be frightened of those conversations. You don't have to go deep, deep into that conversation. You don't have to you know, going to the ins and outs of what it is to be trans, there are, again, great guidance out there of on examples of just ways in which you can have creative conversations with children and young people around gender diversity. There are session plans and resources on the Jaya's website, on uh, Educational Action, Proud Trust, No Outsiders, Stonewall, all those resources. You can go on, click as a school, and they give you almost walk you through what that could look like so you don't have to be on your own doing it it's amazing amazing stuff and i think something that we've been looking at is the understanding the world topic within schools as well and just seeing how children when they go back to school they might have you know classroom activities when they say you know who lives in my house and it might just be gran or it might be you know a step sibling and things like that there are it's there is so much more than the traditional kind of nuclear mum dad and we also had a look at my sister daisy do you remember yeah as well there's um a great um bookshop in manchester shout out to queer lit in manchester when this <laughs> is full of like all these amazing books like um my sister daisy and then it's got like comic books as well um so like a range of early years all the way up to adulthood and there's also in i forgot what it's called it was really embarrassing and <laughs> um, there's a like a department store like an alternative department store in Affleck's in manchester that also has um a, a really good bookshop like a i think it's just called pride bookshop i don't mm. i'll have to double check but there's some amazing books out there so many resources so it's really positive to see them coming more and more into just like you like water stones or like um, just regular. Some of them are really good. They're really good. They're not just token. I had that conversation with the teacher. Was like, oh, you know, are they just, you know, is it just the, the woke thing at the time? People just churning out these books because it's the new, interesting things to talk about. I'm like, no, hey, you know, there was a bit of a slightly, you know, daft argument in general because we, we should always be be writing books around mirroring society. But also, these books are genuinely brilliant. They they, they teach such important values around love and compassion and generosity. All the qualities that me as a parent would love my child to possess. <laughs> so whether it's about a gender diverse child or a gay penguin or whatever it might be, that's that's just the vehicle. The message behind the message behind these books is love. And for me, I might it might sound a bit, you know, a bit wishy washy and a bit, you know, a bit liberal, but I just want my, my child to be a loving child and and those books teach that. They teach tolerance and acceptance and love. And I think, for me, 
that's that's what's important about having these books what you, you're not doing and again I, I've, I've heard this argument by oh if we put all these books on the shelf we're we're almost pushing it and and, and parents will come to us and say we're pushing a trans agenda or a lgbt way of life are you are you pushing it and what's that what does that mean what does that look like by having books that educate people you feel that that's what trying to trying to what could convince children to be i mean for me it's it's a really daft argument um you're not trying to push something what you're trying to do is provide education if you look at you know ofsted um and british values it's part of it is, is children learning about different kinds of people and learning to love and respect them all these books and all these resources do that it's, you're not you're not pushing an agenda you're not trying to make children anything all you're trying to do is is mirror society and allow children to learn about people who are different than them and that's that's brilliant i'm sure any any good parent would want their child to be a loving compassionate child so um again advice to anyone who's thinking oh should i put these books in my school or should i have these conversations and, and will i come under scrutiny the argument is you're doing your bit as a teacher to provide safe spaces where children can can learn and learn love and compassion i can't see anything wrong with that before we wrap up what would be the key takeaway or message that you would like our listeners um especially early as practitioners to remember from what we've discussed today absolutely i just want people to remember that we're talking about children in it who are as you all know if you're listening to this and working in an early year setting they are the most fascinating frustrating but wonderful little creatures and they are little sponges that are constantly absorbing the world around them and learning something every 10 seconds they learn something new or they see something you have a wonderful opportunity to provide this next generation um the opportunity to 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 learn more around compassion and love and diversity and that is such a good thing for society so what i would say is as kind of final thoughts are be be brave be, be brave as, as an early year practitioner and look around your setting and go, how can I do better by the communities that we serve and the communities that are out there? Aside from what the government say, what the papers say, what, you know, the, the more vocal parents who maybe aren't as understanding or as compassionate, don't worry about them. Be, be, be brave and think about the people that, that need you and that is the minority communities need to be represented. I'm not asking you to do anything um, that isn't, I think, simple, small wins. Look at your classroom. Is it immersive? Is it representative of diversity? Have you got a shared language in your school? Have you got a commitment from the very top of your school, your governors and the people that run your school, right down to the, you know, the people on the, on the you know, the, 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 the sharp and the cold face, if you like, the people who, you know, are on your reception, the people who are a midday supervising, all the people that come into to contact with children, are they all understanding of the ideas around diversity and how to have those conversations? And if not, there's training available. Reach out, find it. There's, there's so many organizations, no maids being one, that will help and guide you. So just take the initiative as a school or an earlier setting. Here's the training and the support that's out there check yourself and check your school and or your environment and say are we using gendered language and if so why and could we make a new shared culture and just have a commitment have a commitment to just making children feel safe and loved and, and validated and by doing that you will automatically make gender diverse children and their families feel better just by making your settings more inclusive in general um i think that's really my takeaway the small wins mean big impact for children and their families so even a small thing that you think might even not be be massive could have a lifelong impact on a student so i'd, I'd be brave be be brave in in your endeavors to educate and i think that's what will eventually hopefully make the world a better place for for trans youth i love that be brave it's just really yeah. well said. right yeah, you've given us so many important resources and ways that people can uh, get in touch. How about if uh, people wanted to support the Mermaids charity work? How could they do that? Are there any projects coming up? We remember you mentioned you were going to Parliament last time we spoke. How did that go? That's right. So uh, we have the usual kind of 
donation um, and, and support through our website. So you go on our Mermaid UK website, there's ways you can donate. There's a mailing list so you can hear about what we're doing and you can find out a little bit more. Um, but in terms of the kind of work we're doing at the moment, um, so the work I'm doing at the moment, um, so yeah, we have an amazing, amazing opportunity um, that was organized through our kind of policy and campaigns team at Mermaid. They got contacted um, uh, by an MP who said, how about we get some gender diverse young people to come to parliament to meet MPs and to talk about what it really means to be a trans person today, a trans young person, what what the reality is, what are the key issues and what could um, politicians do better to help support them. Um, so we, we, we got a group together um, from the young people that I've been working closely with and we went, yeah, we went to, went to the House of Commons, we met with MPs, the young people spoke to them. It was a really lovely, empowering event where so many MPs openly admitted this isn't an area that they knew a great deal about other than the kind of intentious stuff, other than what was the kind of hot topic and, and stuff around, you know, the, the sort of the uh, perceived dangers around trans lives and then some of the real misinformation was really the only thing that they knew and they hadn't, they openly admit they hadn't really met a trans young person. So I, I, young people got a brilliant opportunity to sort of speak to them and say, look, these are the things that will make our life better. These are the small wins. These are the things that, you know, we'd like to eat it here. And it was a really lovely symbiotic chat. And, and from that has come some really brilliant opportunities to carry on these creative conversations. So that, that was a really great um, opportunity. Um, and we have more like that. I'm going to be running in the next uh, year, another program called Mango, which we ran last year, which is a advocacy network um programming which young people can learn about ways to get their voices heard and, and platform their voices and how to make differences in their communities we also have an amazing campaigners network that's just started up which is about um actually starting campaigns what do trans young people and their communities want to campaign about what do they want to make changes what are the things they really think that they could make changes on so there's some really exciting things happening there and then just lovely events where young people get together that's one of the things that matter the most to me trans joy is is something that means a great deal to me in my life and i want to try to impart to other young people so i like to try and create events such as uh, we had an event um in march called transcend and that was about just normalizing trans lives so it was a, a kind of careers advice event in which we got lots of trans older people from the community to come and talk about just their lives even the boring bits the going to work the just living just trans people living authentically and, and thriving in many ways. So lots and lots of exciting things to, to kind of come out of Mermaids. We're, we're forever growing and evolving and learning. And I really hope in my role, I can provide just more spaces for trans youth and their families to come together and, and, and feel cared for. It's been amazing speaking to you today, Dee. You're so passionate about what you do and you're so lovely. <laughs> I really have to, to do the job I do. I really, really truly at home. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we've loved talking to you. Where can our listeners, if they wanted to reach out to you, as best to go? Are you on social? Yeah, probably best for, for Mermaids. Um, yeah. You can email us at info at mermaids.org.uk and you can sort of um, request to to speak to me. Uh, that's probably the best way. Um, again, if you go on the website, there's, there's lots of ways in which you can contact us and you can specifically um, ask to be kind of directed. To, to me if there's any things that you would like to talk around around youth advocacy and stuff but really any any one of mermaids would be more than happy to help and direct you so just get in touch with us go on our, go on our, our website and sort of navigate your way around there and you'll find plenty of people who are willing to to advise and, and guide so just just reach out this is what we're here for this is why we exist is to try and make the world better for, for, for trans people so let us help you. <laughs> That's so perfect. And thank you so much for being a guest on our podcast. We've loved speaking to you so much. Yeah. And I hope the weather brightens up. Yeah. I'll probably doing some coaching. It's got really bad now. I'm just looking outside. <laughs> the heavens are open. So I'm going to shun the curtains and hide away for a little bit. But thank you so much for having me. It's been absolutely fantastic. What an amazing conversation with Lee. It's been amazing having him on and learning all about the amazing work he's been doing with the mermaids. What was your key takeaway? So I think my key takeaway was when Lee said that you don't necessarily have to lead the conversations with children, like you don't necessarily have to like inundate them with information about gender and just anything really, not in, not even just gender. Children are naturally curious and if they are interested in something, they'll naturally ask those questions. 
And it's then where you should have the open conversations and not be afraid to be honest and then ask them questions about what they're curious about. For me, it was hearing Lee speak about how diverse spaces benefit everybody. Being brave and taking steps to reflect the world around us is so important and easy to do with simple resources like Pictabook. I think it's also important when we're talking about how classrooms can ensure that they have a gender diverse space Mm. within the classroom and then it's not reinventing the wheel. It's just small changes or even things that you're just already doing that you don't realize are having a benefit to children. Things like if you have an like imaginative play area, are you separating the costumes into gender roles or are you just putting everything on one rack and allowing children to just dress up how they want? It's just little things like that that I think would have a real benefit to everyone, not just um, not not just necessarily talking about gender diversity. Mm. We'd like to give a huge thank you to Lee Lester for joining us today. Let us know what you thought about this episode. Get in touch with us by going to Instagram at Early Years Resources or Facebook, also Early Years Resources. Thank you so much for listening. Bye.